Hi, I'm Ira Flato. You're listening to Science Friday. Did you know that China has a very active space program, including a space station and rovers on the moon? NASA's Artemis program, it says we will go back to the moon this time to stay. So China has something similar in its mind. Over the past few years, I have become really interested in the Chinese space program. They've launched complicated robotic moon missions. They've brought back samples of rock from the far side of the moon. And I thought, you know, if this was NASA doing this, we'd all be talking about it every other week. And now with big budget cuts proposed at NASA, is China going to become the global leader in space? Joining me now is Ling Xin, science reporter at the South China Morning Post. She's based in Ohio. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you, Ira, for having me. China has some really interesting space missions. Let's talk about it. Just this week, they released a picture from a spacecraft headed to an asteroid. Yes. So that mission is the second in a series of uh, deep space mission, which means beyond the moon. Uh, the first one was a Tianwen-1 Mars mission, which was very successful. China uh, made it to the Mars surface in its first attempt to land on the red planet. And now this is a second one, Tianwen-2. Actually, it's a very uh, time-consuming mission. The entire thing is going to take 10 years. It has two major goals. First of all, it's going to bring back samples from an asteroid. That's going to take about three years. And after that, the main spacecraft will use the Earth gravity for a slingshot and begin a seven-year journey to Comet 311P, an object in the solar system's asteroid belt known for shedding uh, dust in multiple tails. Wow, that is some mission. I know the, the Chang uh, lunar missions have also been impressive with landers and rovers, and there's that sample return mission. Does China have a roadmap here, a, you know, an overall idea of where it's headed? Uh, yes. China's lunar exploration program started in the 1990s. It was actually first proposed by a geologist. So it was proposed as a series of science missions sending robotic uncrewed spacecraft to do scientific exploration uh, of the moon. So it was designed in a very step-by-step uh, way. First of all, you do an orbit of the moon, and then you try to land on the moon, and then you try to bring samples back. And China planned it uh, well enough to have a backup mission for each of this stage. For instance, Chang'e 2 was a backup of Chang'e 1, you know, in case Chang'e 1 fails. But if Chang'e 1 succeeds, Chang'e 2 will be assigned to do something else. So China has completed all these six uh, missions so far with zero failure. Hmm. Do they eventually want to land on the moon with the humans, send people there? Yes, yes. Actually, they are working towards this. I believe they are already making the flight models of everything uh, from the lander to the uh, astronaut suits. And the Chinese government has said uh, multiple times that they are on track to land Chinese astronauts on the moon's surface by 2030, if not earlier. And then eventually Mars, perhaps? Um, the government hasn't said anything specifically about a crewed mission to the Mars, but China is working on bringing back rock samples from Mars. Yeah, well, we've just, NASA just said they're not, they just canceled their return mission of these Mars samples. So maybe China will get there first. It's really a shame because you've done such a good job collecting all the samples. And China's, China's approach will be very different from uh, NASA's approach. China will just uh, select one landing site and just touch down and uh, maybe uh, deploy a lander and then a rover and just sample in that area and then kind of grab and go. Grab and go. 
is unlike like the different varieties of samples collected by NASA all over all these years. Yeah, and NASA samples will stay there. Uh, we we talk a lot about the International Space Station, but as I said before, China has its own space station, and there is another one planned for near the moon, right? Yes, there's not much、uh, official information about it, but it's、uh, it's very similar to NASA's、uh, Luna Gateway. So the space station will be、uh, orbiting the moon as a bridge between Earth, Moon, and deeper space.、Mm -hmm. And the long-term goal of this is that it would be international, like, like countries, other countries joining in. The Luna space station thing is a little bit far. Right now, they are working on the、um, research base,、uh, probably in the South Pole region of the Moon, very similar to、uh, what the U.S. has planned.、Uh, and this is actually also an international effort. A lot of people compare that to the Artemis Accords, but this one is led by China and Russia.、Uh, Russia will be providing the nuclear、uh, power、hmm. for the station. Between ten and twenty countries and organizations、uh, have already signed on to the China-led、uh, moon base program already.、Mm -hmm. How is、uh, China's space program organized? I mean, is there an equivalent of NASA, one main organizing body? No, no.、Uh, NASA is kind of the one that handles everything related to civilian space, but、uh, China does not have a equivalent. Of NASA, China's space program is top-down, government-led, but it's there is a split between uncrewed and crewed mission. Okay, the uncrewed civilian missions are managed by an organization called China National Space Administration (CNSA),、uh, which does all these lunar robotic missions and satellites and international collaboration. However, all the manned Thing, for instance, the Tiangong Space Station is run by the military. So it is this agency is called China Manned Space Agency,、uh, and it reports to China's top military body. One thing that I have never understood, I mean, I watched it happen, is is that the U.S. is barred by law from collaboration with the Chinese space program, isn't it? Yes. So.、Uh, A lot of people know the Wolf Amendment, which was proposed by a Republican representative、uh, from Virginia, Wolf, in、uh, 2011, that bars NASA from working directly, bilaterally, with China on space projects unless unless Congress gives special approval. But there is something else that is less known, which is called ITAR. ITAR is a U.S. export control law that restricts sharing of any technology with potential military use, including a lot of space components.、Huh. You know, some of the things that China is doing, the U.S. has already done.、Uh, are there missions that are really just Chinese firsts?、Uh, <laughs> yes, I would say, for instance, when China was doing the two、uh, lunar far side missions. Uh, they did a、uh, some kind of first by putting in、uh, relay satellites in the、uh, Earth Moon space. So、mm -hmm. these satellites need to see, quote unquote, okay, see the Earth and also the far side of the the Moon at the same time. And such satellites just they just relay data. Between the Earth and the far side of the Moon,、uh, and th they are seen as a、um, critical space infrastructure.、Um, so the, this second one that China put in、uh, for the Chang'e very complicated the Chang'e six mission and also the forthcoming、uh, lunar base project, it is very powerful. It can actually、uh, support ten spacecraft on the lunar far side at the same time. Wow. Well, of course, they're also the first to have that sample return from the far side of the moon, too. Yes, scientifically, that's really, really unique because we know Apollo samples come to how many three hundred and eighty something kilograms, but all of those are from the near side. Yeah, it would be like going to the U.S. desert and thinking you got a 
a good sample of what the Earth looks like in one spot. Um, I, and, of course, the, the Chinese ha are operating a telescope. They were the first to put a telescope on the surface of the moon for, what, a decade? Yes, that actually got onto the moon. It was the Chang'e 3 mission. It's a very small telescope with a 50 millimeter aperture, but it is the first one. And it has actually worked for more than 10 years. Do you have a sense of how much China budgets for its space operations? We know very little about that. NASA needs to be transparent with its budget, um, but a large part of China's space mission has to do with the military. So the uh, scientists who first initiated the Chang'e uh, lunar program once mentioned that the Chang'e 1 mission actually only cost 200 million yuan, which was the cost to dig uh, one kilometer of metro tunnel in Beijing. So he meant to say that it's it's really not that expensive. But that is the only reliable number about budget we know so far. Yeah, it must be challenging for you as a reporter to learn about this when so much of the work is kept secret. Must be frustrating. <laughs> yeah, the, this this withhold of information is really, really challenging, uh, including the, the Tianwen-2 spacecraft you just mentioned. You know, uh, until this moment, we still don't know how the spacecraft looks like, uh, like what the size and the, how, how heavy it is. Uh, because somehow they decided to publish mission profile only after a mission is successful. Hmm. Let's finish up by talking about some of the missions that we should keep an eye on. Tell us about some of them, please. Okay. So NASA's, NASA's Artemis program, uh, it says we will go back to the moon this time to stay. So China has something similar in its mind. It eyes to build a base and all the infrastructure to live and work from the moon. So what we can look at is uh, next year, uh, they, they are going to launch the Chang'e 7 mission, and that mission will include a hopper, which will jump to the bottom of uh, craters in the South Pole region to look for water ice, which can be used for life support and making rocket fuels and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then in 2028, they are going to launch the Chang'e 8 mission, and will attempt uh, something no one else has done before, which is to build the first brick on the moon. Uh, it will test whether local um, lunar soil can be turned into construction material and whether those bricks can be assembled into real structures. Wow. I, I'm envisioning down the road a 3D printer on the moon. Yeah. Printing out these bases. That's that's definitely one one way to go. Yeah, there is actually a community of hundreds of Chinese scientists working on these things, uh, which will eventually uh, lead to the Chinese moon base. Well, I want to thank you for taking time to be with us today. It has been a fascinating discussion about a lot of Chinese space stuff. Very few of us, I think, are very aware of. Thank you, Ling Xin, science reporter at the South China Morning Post based in Ohio. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. Thank you very much. After the break, seeing the night sky in a new way with your fingers. You can not only see the outlines of the constellations, but you can feel the stars and feel the constellations uh, with these upraised tactile parts. Stick around. Hey, Flora here. We're wrapping up Science Friday's fiscal year on June 30th, and we could use your support. I know I don't need to tell you, it is a tenuous time for science and for public media, and we are relying on donations from our listeners more than ever. We're aiming to raise $40,000 to close out our budget, and with your help, I know we can do it. So if Science Friday is valuable to you, if you rely on our reporting to make sense of the world or just give you a little joy, please consider going to sciencefriday.com slash donate to make a donation. It's fast, easy, secure, and any amount you can swing will help sustain us in this critical moment. Thank you. We have said it before, and we really mean it. Science Friday can only continue with your support. That's sciencefriday.com slash donate. Thank you.
Another way to look at space is with your fingers, with a tactile astronomy book for the visually impaired. Astronomer Dean Regas joins us. He's the author of All About Orion. Welcome back, Dean. Oh, glad to be here. Nice to have you. From from the title, I'm guessing, this is a book about constellations? Yeah, so uh, the book All About Orion, well, we're going to be talking about the mythology behind this famous constellation, how to find it in the sky, some of his friends, his uh, other constellations like Taurus and Scorpius, uh, and then some deep space objects. But uh, the twist on this is that it's actually tactile. So you can not only see the outlines of the constellations, but you can feel the stars and feel the constellations uh, with these upraised tactile parts. Is it aimed at any age group? Well, as most of my books go, they're, they're supposed to be for kids, but they're always sneaky for adults, too. So I always <laughs> throw in a lot of stuff for all ages, uh, but mostly for you know elementary, middle, even high school. Uh, but I think adults are going to have a lot of fun with it, too. All right. Tell us about the, the mechanics of a tactile book. How does that work? Well, uh, so I partnered with a local publisher here in Cincinnati called Clovernook, and they're the Clovernook Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And they do mostly reprints of books in Braille, and they came up with this idea that they wanted to make a new book themselves specifically for that audience. And uh, I had uh, this idea of doing a, you know, touch the constellations book and it just came together. And so we've got a couple versions. One of them is a uh, large print with tactile constellations where you can feel the outlines of them and you can feel the outlines of things like the Orion Nebula and uh, the Horsehead Nebula. And then there's another version where it's complete Braille over top of text. So it's really for people that can that are sighted and with visual impairments that they can read together. So constellations aren't just the shapes. You have stars of different brightness or different color, right? I mean, is that information you can convey through touch? We can with the uh, the star brightnesses. There's a key that goes with it. So the, the bigger the circles that you can feel, the brighter the stars are out there. And of course, one of the big hits is talking about the star Betelgeuse, which is uh, one of the super massive stars in our galaxy. And there's even a scale representation of Betelgeuse versus the sun that you can see huh. and touch. Well, I can't uh, let you go without you giving us some idea of some sky highlights coming up this summer. What might we be looking out for? Well, I am sorry to say Orion is not one of those things. In the summer sky, Orion kind of hides behind the sun, so uh, we won't see him up there. But we will see the uh, constellation that in mythology killed Orion. Scorpius the scorpion Ooh. is the big one that starts coming up in the southern sky uh, after dark and has a wealth of really great night sky objects. Uh, if you look, look towards the south, you see Scorpius, you see Sagittarius, and that is where the heart of the Milky Way is. Right. That is the, what the summer season is for. You can see uh, lots of star clusters, lots of nebulas, and lots of stars over there. How about planets? Well, we, we got a planet drought in the evening sky. All the big planets are out of the way. Mars is still hanging around, uh, faintly shining in the evening sky. But Venus is the big one in the morning, also with Saturn there, too. So for your early risers, you're greeted to the, the day with Venus. Well, we'll have to just do with that until we can have you back on and talk more about the next sky showing. Thank you, Dean, and good luck with the book. Absolutely. Keep looking up. Astronomer Dean Regis, author of All About Orion and host of the Looking Up podcast. That's about all the time we have for now. A lot of people help make this show happen. Sandy Roberts. Jordan Smudgek. Emma Gomez. Valissa Mayers. I'm Ira Flato. Thanks for listening.